So in the year 2000, I was standing on the stage at the Glastonbury Festival in front of about 15,000 people, right before Keanu Reeves' band Dogstar performed, which I'm sure probably has been lost to the mists of history along with many other bands. And then three years later in 2003, I found myself in front of a very different audience. I found myself in front of 42 students at Van Nuys High School, and they just had one question for me. Anybody guess what it was? They said, why do we have to learn algebra? And at the time, I'd only been teaching for a little while, so I really didn't know what to say. I came up with a couple of lame reasons, like, you'll need it later, or there are lots of jobs that use Algebra 1. But the more that I looked at what I was teaching, really? I mean, how many people do you know that use this on a daily basis? I'm thinking to myself, apart from other teachers, I don't know anybody who uses the quadratic formula in their job. Actually, it's not quite true. I do know one guy. My brother-in-law actually works at NASA. He's an engineer and was on the engineer on the space shuttle. And I guess he uses it from time to time. But one person, and he's literally a rocket scientist. So in the end, of course, in my classroom, I came up with the only thing I could use to get my kids to learn. I said, hey, you have to learn the quadratic formula because it's going to be on the test. <laughs> oh, and I knew as soon as I said it, I knew I had done a bad thing. I knew that at that point, I'd given my students permission to not care about math. Math became something that they were learning, they were memorizing, they were just doing what they had to do to pass the test. Information was going in, they were putting it out on an assessment, but that wasn't learning. There was no real excitement going on. And the sad thing is, they weren't alone. In a survey of students all across America, kids were asked, why do you study math? And here are some of the responses. Because it comes after English class. <laughs> yeah, all right, that's a good one. Because it's in the Bible and George Bush says I have to. <laughs> and probably the best one, because my teacher will get fired if she doesn't teach it. <laughs> wow. So students, a lot of students really don't know why they're learning math. And many teachers are even teaching it because they feel they have to. It's not surprising then that it's the least popular subject in America and we're not actually very good at it. Quite why I went into teaching it, having starred on the stage in front of 15,000 people and then going to teach math is a whole other story which we'll get into another time. But one of the big problems is that for many, many people, math looks something like this. It's like magic. It's like, well, I take these numbers, I have no idea how it works, but I put them into this formula, I plug some stuff, Anybody here learned how to add fractions by drawing a crisscross between the fractions and then you put a little smile across the bottom, oh, I see the hands, yeah, keep them coming. And then you multiply across the lines and you go, hey, I got the right answer. I have no idea how it worked. It was absolute magic and it's amazing, but hey, it works for me and I got through my test. That is terrible. That is not learning. That is not what math is about. It's almost the opposite of what math is about. Math is the opposite of magic. It's magically beautiful. Well, I think it is anyway. But math is actually completely different to this. Let's look at what real learning looks like. Here's learning. This is my son, Cameron. I'm a little bit proud. Um, but he's 18 months old. And yes, we can, we can go off. Oh. <laughs> and he, um, this is one of his favorite toys right now. It, I'm sure you've all seen these types of games. He's got some blocks, and there's a, a box which you can push the blocks through. The trouble is, he's got a lot to learn. He's got to figure out how to match the edges of one three-dimensional shape with the hole that it has to fit into. He has to understand that each of the blocks will only go into one and only one hole. There's all of this stuff that he has to learn. And he's going to learn it. But his brain is not wired with this information, not yet. Nobody's brain ever came wired with this information. Albert Einstein was not able to successfully solve this problem as an 18-month-year-old. Everybody has to learn it. But the cool thing is, as Cameron learns this, he is literally 
going to rewire his mind. He's going to make new connections. He's going to build new neural networks in his head based upon all the learning. But that learning is going to be messy. He's going to have to struggle. He's going to have to get things wrong. He's going to have to put a lot of blocks in holes, and it's all going to fall apart. But he will gradually figure it out. That's what learning looks like. But when you learn like that, when you struggle, when you push, when you figure stuff out for yourself, that's when you literally rewire what's going on in your head. And that's what math should look like. I'm sure everybody's familiar with these rules. Positive times positive is positive. Good, just checking. And of course, I'm sure you all know that negative times negative is also positive. But why? I mean, you know, I, I, that was a rhetorical question. I will take answers later on. So, but we all know these things. We've memorized these things. But really, math is about figuring out why and being able to answer and being not afraid to say, yes, I know why. I can explain why. So here's one way of looking at it. Oh, we have some Gigi fans in the house. Yes, OK. <laughs> For those of you who are not familiar, I have left the classroom and build games with a little penguin called Gigi. So here's Gigi. Gigi needs to get across this gap. And we're going to multiply two numbers together to help Gigi get across the gap. First of all, we're going to multiply this block by negative 2. And here we go. Multiplies it by 2. And multiplying by negative flips it. And then we're going to multiply by another negative number. And what's that going to do? It's going to flip it again. Multiply it by one negative. Multiply it by another negative. Negative times negative is positive. Simple. We can see it. It's no longer a mystery. Math is not mysterious. Math helps us to figure out and explain how the world works. Similarly, can anybody tell me, when I throw this ball in the air, what kind of curve is that? Anybody tell me what that's called? An arch. Yeah, there's a word beginning with a P. Someone just said it. Parabola. Absolutely. So that quadratic formula that I had up here earlier, that was about parabolas. So one way of looking at parabolas is to analyze them using the formulas, which is perfectly valid. But as mathematicians, what we want to do is we want to build tools that allow us to explore parabolas, that allow us to look at them and think, hmm, I can make them narrow. I can even make them go down. I can tip them up and down. I can drag the whole parabola up. These are tools, these are ways of looking at math that actually makes it come to life, make it real. Math is about looking beyond the surface and actually seeing what's going on behind the world, seeing what's underneath. And when we do that, incredible things can happen. This would allow you, for example, not just to play Angry Birds, <laughs> but to be able to build Angry Birds, because you understand how games like that work. So in art, for example, in design, to be able to see perspective, that's seeing the math behind what's occurring. In medicine, if you had a serious injury 200 years ago, do you know what you'd have probably been given as a treatment for that? You'd have been given a course of leeches. But now, we don't do that. We understand the mechanism behind wounds, so therefore we clean them, we bandage them, and we give you antibiotics. And even in music, because math also applies to music. Let's say there's a song. Let's say there's a song that you really love. And it feels like I am just too close to love you. Yeah, you don't have to turn it down. It's all good. Um, there's a song that you really love, but you're thinking, oh, I just happen to be in this final of this national music competition, and I'm trying to sing this song, but it's just a little bit too low for my voice. But instead of thinking about that song in terms of the notes, if you've had the sort of mathematical training, you're able to go, hmm, that's the first, and I know the next chord is a minor third above it, and then it goes to the fourth. And you can see how the notes are arranged in your mind. And if somebody says, oh, you know what, I need to push it up a few keys, you can just move it up really simply until it sounds something like this. Same song, completely different key. The whole thing has just been transposed up. That is mathematical thinking. That's being able to apply the ability that you learn in math to other things in the world around you. So, 
Next time you're sitting in class, think to yourself, math, being good about math, is not about being able to do it fast. It's not about being able to memorize tons of formulas. Being good at math is about being able to figure out what's happening underneath. And when you do that, when you learn by struggling, by thinking, by figuring things out, you will literally rewire your brain and upgrade yourselves, giving yourselves the ability to take on the 21st century, succeed, thrive, and survive. Thank you very much.